Hello, my name is Arthur Curtis. I am a lifelong initiate, someone on a journey. And for decades now, my life has been involved in magic, initiation, and the path less travel. A magician is an interesting person in that most that I know have open minds. They have open minds, open hearts, some are interested in science, some are not. All tend to follow their intuition as they go through life. They want to open doors, ultimately to create new paradigms, new ways, new paths. My interest in magic, in a way, began when I was 15 years old. And I've talked about this to other magicians, and a lot of us started out exactly at that age, or close to it. So around that time, when I was 15, I decided I was suddenly interested in, it must have been a calling, right? I was suddenly interested in mediumship and seances. And from there, it blossomed over the decades. So at this point, we're talking about three plus decades of magic and initiation. I think I chose my path, or paths, if you want to look at the plural of it, because there were things that were obvious, hidden in plain sight. Things I did not know. Things I wanted to know. What's the connection between two sentient beings? How is it that we feel things? Do things go bump in the night? Are there things that go bump in the night? And what are they? And Importantly, perhaps the basic, basic question for me is this. Do I have a say? Do I have a say in my life? Do I have a say in terms of using my will? Do I have a say in my fate or my destiny to things I consider to be different things but connected things? The answer to all of those questions, to the three questions at least, is yes, yes, and yes. I can exercise my will. And that doesn't mean willpower. I can have a say in my fate. And that, in turn, plays out in my destiny, which is the long game. Magic has affected my life in countless ways. I don't even know if I could begin to list them, but here are a few. In the people I've met, like the person doing this interview right now. In other people I've met over my life in long-term, deep friendships, some of them quite intimate. Friendships that have resulted in my calling other people brother or a sister. In some cases, people I'd not met in person to begin with. Magic has told me that I can exert my will and I can get results. But here's an important tiny notation for those thinking of going down this path. The results will almost always not, and I just want to repeat that, not be what you expect. The results will almost always be what you need. And in some cases, so we've I... changed our world jointly together, and it is the most fantastic thing. I've also learned that I am so not alone. You may have your array of uh, entities, gods, goddesses, other beings, alien life forms, as is my case, um, sorry, as is my case, uh, you may have an array of entities that you hope or wish that you could communicate with. You don't have to hope. You don't have to wish. You can do it. And I've done it as well. So it's expanded my horizon in so many different ways uh, to the point where I have to say decades ago, uh, people would come up and say to me, there's something different about you. Is there something different about you? And I've always answered yes, but I have to say quite honestly, um, here's a general statistic for you. Probably only 5% or less of the people I've said that answer to ever bring it forward, ever pursue it on their own. So it's my great hope that by this interview and by others, I can share the wealth, which is in fact yours to take. So I've been asked what a magus is. In broad strokes, um, 
across various philosophical belief systems, including one I'm quite fond of in the temple. Amagus is, or Amaga, is someone who brings to a crux, brings to a single point in time, something they've worked their entire life on. I would have to say my own experience with my word, and that is what a magus or maga does. They bring forth a single word that encapsulates everything they've worked for, and it's alive. It's a creative formula. It's available from the moment they speak it. In some organizations, you need to be recognized as having done just that thing. Um, anyone can say, hey, I'm a magus, I'm a maga, and, uh, and here's my word. Uh, but there's got to be something in terms of documenting that proof, in terms of comparing yourself to others who have gone this path before and who have made the same claims. Have they had an impact? Importantly, can anyone other than them use this word? So the word is a single crystallization, a single moment that is spoken in a nanosecond, even though, like myself, I spent decades and decades coming to that word. And in fact, I would go one step further and say that a word is something that is remembered. It gestates in you. So one doesn't simply claim when she or he first starts magic or when they first start magic, hey, I'm a magus. Here's my word. Here's my philosophy. Here's my teaching. They normally um, evolve their states of being or evaluated along the way. So you go through several stages in organizations like the Temple of Set where um, you first declare that you are on your own path. You are going to go your own way. Um, and then you're recognized as being somebody who's mastered magic. Uh, then you're recognized as being one of um, uh, what we would call the priesthood. That is somebody that goes their own way uh, with their magic. Then you master yourself internally. And finally, everybody at that particular stage who has mastered themselves internally must have, uh, by virtue of what, they're been th what they have been through, must have a word inside them. That is not to say it is always spoken, that it will always raise itself to your consciousness, that it will always put you up against the wall until you finally are compelled to speak it. When you finally speak it, you release your teaching to the world at large, not just to any organization you belong to, but it's released in the world. It has a current. It's operational. At that point, it's concurrently operational with any and all magical words ever spoken before. My word alters what I would call the eon or the eonic mix, does not change it in a major way like some words do. And uh, there are certainly a few of me who have altered words that change the matrix of the eon. So from that point on, you give it up. It belongs to someone else. In fact, it belongs to everyone else. You learn on your own separate journey um, how to deal with that, how to further understand it, how to further apply it. But the important thing is, others feed back to you. So the greatest thrill and the most important thing that can happen to me is when someone says, I want to work with Sinesis, or I think I am working with Sinesis, and tells me how they're doing it. Because I could not have even imagined how they're doing it. So they add to it and add to it. And then there's this cohesion that takes place. Cohesive resonance, I guess is the term for it. And others who come after can more easily work with it more quickly. In the meantime, most magi I'm aware of inside of organizations or outside of them must do this duty. It's called a task and a curse. For endless days, it does not stop. So that's the short version of how I see a magus is someone who has uttered a single word with a formula behind it that we all can use. And Sinesis has everything to do with information, communications, and community. 
maybe one of the most basic ways of talking about synesis is to say it is about connection, your connection with any other sentient being, any other life form, and the purity of closeness in that connection. How much of it you're actually experiencing. The length and breadth and depth of the connection with other life forms. And also, your ability to open yourself to communication from non-obvious ways, through non-obvious senses. They used to call these things clairvoyance and telepathy and so forth and so on, and it's simply an augmentation of the senses you already have. So if I was to say, how can you do uh, synesis? You can do that by opening yourself up, by becoming safely vulnerable in terms of other people, by saying, I will not let anything stand in the way of that person or that entity's message and the wholeness or fullness of it. I, I will not filter things out because I don't like what I'm hearing or because I don't like the messenger. I will make sure I'm as available to that communication as, or connection as I possibly can be. And so you might have to actually make a conscious decision, a decision of intention, that I will be more aware, I'll have a wider bandwidth when I'm communicating with anyone or anything else. And one last bit of this. Some of the information you may experience will be so vast once you open yourself up that it cannot be processed in one session. Some have called such things a download. So a download is just a rush, an onslaught of information you cannot process all at once. This will happen to you if you take synesis as one of your paths or one of your tools. You can process the information later because all information is available always in space-time, past, present, and future. And Synesis is one of those tools that can connect you with that info no matter when it occurred or when it will occur. So maybe connections, another way of putting it. So one of the ways I see Synesis is in terms of, and I know photographers will get this, depth of field. We have a very shallow depth of field normally in terms of trying to understand what is being communicated to us. Whether that communication is written, verbal, thought or waveforms or otherwise. We generally have a shallow or a narrow bandwidth for it, a narrow broadband or bandwidth for it. We understand very little of it. And the reason we understand so little of it has to do with a lifetime's worth of filters and biases and education and upbringing and indoctrination that we've been subject to or we in fact put ourselves through on purpose. We need to lose the filters, the indoctrination, the biases. One important thing you can do if you're interested in synesis is learn to be vulnerable again. Perhaps you forgot that. Perhaps you were burned, like we all have been burned, maybe several times. So the last thing you want to do is be vulnerable. I'm going to say to you, the first thing you want to do is be vulnerable. That's called safe vulnerability. It's a choosy, selective vulnerability. The more you are vulnerable, meaning accessible, the more others may be, could be, vulnerable and more accessible. The more accessible we all are, the purer the information we get, the purer the content, the closer to the source we get, the more we're going to understand what was actually being said, or perhaps better. We understand what was said or spoken or thought between the lines. We understand the subtext. And there's more subtext in every communication than you can possibly imagine. That's the thing to try to nail down. So here are a couple of really simple things you can do if you want to test the theory out or if you're the disbelieving type. And I get it. I've been met with skepticism all my life, but here I am. So one simple way to do this is to start to journalize 
what we call random or fleeting thoughts. They happen to us all, right? You're going about your business. You're probably distracted. This is something to take note of. You're probably distracted with something else. And you have this fleeting thought that goes by. And it could be the simplest thing, like, oh, my sister's going to call, that kind of thing. Or, oh, um, I was just thinking about my credit card, this kind of thing. You forget about it almost in a nanosecond. Later that day, maybe a minute later, maybe several hours later, your sister calls. Or there's a problem with your credit card uh, that you apparently just now became aware of. If you do a little journalizing, and I have a friend that does this, um, he has begun to see patterns. He has begun to be able to use this information consciously, not be subject to it, not at someone else's or something else's whim or want, but his whim or want. By generalizing, he's been able to put two and two together and be more predictive. Then he's been able to go back and unpack, to use the term, the information that was there in the fleeting moment, because it's never a simple thing. For instance, oh, I think my sister's going to call. That could be just because she's going to call, but it might be you haven't heard from your sister in seven months, and she calls because she's had um, an issue, a problem, something went wrong with her health or the health of her family. Obviously, she's been thinking of that for minutes, hours, days. So the thought that, oh, my sister's going to call, could be absolutely jam-packed with information that you can retrieve. Uh, so here's another simple way. Um, just do an experiment with a friend, member of the family. Get a normal deck of playing cards. This is so easy to do. Most of them are simply in two colors, red and black. There are lots of layers in playing cards, but that start with simple red and black. Um, do a series of experiments where the cards have been shuffled very well, face down, and um, you pull a card up and look at it, and ask your partner or friend or family member to guess the color. It's just the game, right? It's just the game. And do that in a series of sets of five. So maybe five times 10, maybe 50 times in total. It doesn't really take long. And see if you or your partner or friend or family member can guess red or black more than half the time. Now, slightly more than half the time, even slightly more, is significant. The higher the number of repetitions is significant. Final little experiment I think you can do, and it's one I've played with. We all seem to get a sense that something ominous is going to happen or something's going to happen. Sometimes we get a sense behind our neck, so to speak, that someone's looking at us or following us. It's an instinctual thing, right? So next time you're walking down a corner, before you turn the corner, left or right, um, try to predict, guess, see, is there anyone around the corner? And if there is, because that might be a simple thing, you might live on a busy street, is there anyone around the corner? What are they wearing? What's their dominant color? Are they alone or not? Simple little things. Journalize it. Try it. I think you'll be surprised. These are just little games that you can do. So you want to learn about magic. There are so many paths that you can take. Mine started out with information or interest in seances and mediumship. Yet it brought me forcefully, squarely, to the world of black magic, something I've been practicing for several decades. But before the black magic part, I literally got a book from a bookshelf that taught me or taught people, and I still have it, um, how to become a witch or a warlock. If you don't like the gender notations there, just say how to become a magician, and that might work better for you. I followed the steps, and I became a self-professed warlock at the time. So does this count? Yes, because I made a statement, an internal and external statement, that I wanted to plant my feet firmly on the path of initiation and magic. So there are all sorts of books. There's a gazillion YouTube videos and other videos out there on how to become a magician. 
But just say to yourself, make, make a declaration. I can affect my fate. I can affect and impact my destiny. I can have thoughts that will ripple out into the external world and have an impact. And then choose your variety of magic, white magic, black magic, gray magic, a non-initiatory magic, and begin to do things that you feel will take you from A to B. For instance, if you're just starting, if you're just starting, go out of your way, don't spend too much money, but go out of your way to collect some key symbols. Maybe it's a ring, maybe it's a medallion, or a piece of jewelry, perhaps an onk, if you're into the Egyptian scene, which I am. Um, a grail, which is simply another way of saying a special cup from what you can drink out of. A magical diary. And then begin to write very simple rituals or ceremonies. Make sure you have key ingredients behind them all. Same key ingredients, right? Intention, desire, the will, timing, and passion. Okay? At least those five ingredients behind any ceremony or ritual, I call them workings, any of those that you do. And just start small, not like, I got to win the lotto. This does not work, just saying. So not like I'm going to win the lotto, but maybe like I wish the person I was dating um, would tell me their true feelings. Maybe that hasn't happened for months, years. Or I need a, a better job or a more secure job. Be careful about naming specifics. That might take a while to get there. I need a job. I need a better job. I need to get higher grades. Whatever it is, set your intention, have your desire behind it, passion, timing, and will. And just write a few lines. And then make pretend, make a game out of it. Light a candle, doesn't really matter the color, that's up to you. Um, pour a little something uh, in your grail that you can raise the grail to and promise that this will happen. Um, have a couple of little implements, maybe photographs or jewelry on a makeshift altar that could be your dresser. I mean, that's what I normally use. And do your little ceremony and then, real important, leave it alone. Do not open your email every day saying, the new job offer has got to be there. You will destroy the blueprint you just put in place. We can talk more about that down the line, but that's how I'd start. So I'm asked a lot, and this will never stop, about black magic and its association with heinous things and evil in general. Um, none of the black magicians I know are evil or heinous or do anything bad, actually. The major difference between black magic and white magic, as I understand it, is simple. Black magic is self-directed will. You do something. You take responsibility for the consequences, good or bad. They're not assigned to anyone else. You are not in a protective circle. You're not calling up gods and goddesses or demons that you're fearful of. You're cooperating and collaborating with them. Black magic is willfully directed magic towards outcomes where you say, I have a say in my fate and destiny. Without magic, I know, just to be up close and personal, I wouldn't have the partner I have today. So that's one thing I would say. Without magic, I wouldn't have some of the most important people I know in my life. Without magic, I'd be no kind of leader or mentor, nor would I even be a mentee, nor could I be mentored, because I wouldn't recognize that I know very little. Without magic, I would not have come to that last statement, that I know very little. And truly, even after several decades, I don't know a lot. I know a bunch of little things, but they don't equate and they don't equal a lot. 
Without magic, I could not have lived this rich life, indulgent life, perhaps would not have traveled the world in some of the ways I've traveled it, and would probably never know what heart-based intelligence was, or heart-based intuition. And I certainly wouldn't know the difference between science and magic without magic. In closing, I would tell everyone this. A life of magic and initiation is a rich, fulfilling life. You can accomplish things you would never believe were possible. You can do just about anything, become just about anything. And the mysteries keep unraveling themselves, so you never know them all. You reach a plateau. Well, when you reach that plateau, you can suddenly see beyond it to a new set of mysteries, new veils that should be pierced. If you want to communicate with other entities and other people more effectively, uh, more richly, you want to dip your big toe in an ocean of magic to see what it feels like. And if it comes back and you still have a big toe, I guess it's all right to go forward.